Hello and welcome to the podcast. This is Ron's Amazing Stories, where we play tales to take you away from today. On the program today, we have six different people to help us out. Is that, is that a lot? I think so. Jackie has a question. Oh, she always does that. <laughs> Jeremy, Rita, and Killa all sent in creepy stories for us to enjoy. Cool, man! Then we head to the Cold War in 1962 with a Ben Bova classic called The Next Logical Step. That is a very logical suggestion. We end the show with Rosen and Cody teaming up with a story about a dangerous ride in a Packard sedan. So roll down your window and listen to this five-minute mystery. Another five-minute mystery. This five-minute mystery is being brought to you by Superior Acting, which this story sadly lacks. In fact, I've seen more emotion from a turned-over journal. The story is good even if our actors sound like they've done a few too many five-minute mysteries. Good morning, Chef. Morning, Deputy. Ted just called in and said he'd be late. Springfield bus from Cleveland broke down just outside of Cleveland and won't be in till 11 o'clock. Well, I guess you and I can handle what little business we get here in Springville until then. Oh, Sheriff's Office. Speaking. James Coburn shot. Be right there. Sheriff, the bullet entered his right temple just over the eye, passing through the head and made its exit from the back of the neck. I knew this would happen to James. You uh, knew this would happen, Miss Alice? Yes. You see, Sheriff, some man in Cleveland had attempted to blackmail James because of an earlier romance. And James had threatened to turn the blackmailer over to the police. Because of that, his life was threatened. I had him come here to Springville to hide out for a while. Deputy, uh, have any strange men been reported in town the last few days? Or have you seen any suspicious characters that might have been trying to locate James Coburn? Oh, haven't heard of a soul except some bum that must have dropped off a freight. A short, swarthy-looking guy. That sounds just like the Cleveland man. James described him to me one day. Don't recall anyone saying he'd inquired about Cohen. Hmm. James always seemed like a pretty upright man to me. Oh, James was a very quiet man, Sheriff. He was just unfortunate enough to have been tied up with this affair in his youth. And then this... This gangster had to try a shakedown on him and ruin all our happiness. We... We were to be married. We were going to be married tomorrow and go to Cincinnati to live. James had a job offered him there. I'm sorry. This has been a shock to you, then. Yes, it has, Sheriff. James had written me last week. He asked me to come on the 8.30 bus today. Then we were going on to Cincinnati this afternoon. Oh, I was so happy. I packed all my things and left Cleveland on the bus early this morning. I rushed right out here only to... to find him dead. Oh, if only he'd gone to Cincinnati months ago as I begged him. It would have been just the same, Miss Alice. Well, it couldn't have been. He'd have been safe there. No. No, you'd have tracked him there and murdered him just like you did here. Do you know why the sheriff accused Alice of murdering James Coburn? In just a moment, we shall find out. But first... How underwhelmed they all seemed. I guess they just don't get it. High energy creates high emotions from the listener. By the way, I don't see any reason to suspect the girl, but hey, I'm sure that detective will fill us in and, while doing it, give us some key information that we lacked. And now for the solution to our mystery. Alice... James Coburn was shot by someone facing him as he sat in the chair. Obviously, someone from whom he didn't fear violence, therefore not a man. 
You were the blackmailer, if anyone was, Alice. He probably laughed at your threats today, went back to reading, and you shot him. You said that you arrived this morning at 8.30 on the bus from Cleveland. You couldn't have. That bus broke down, and one of my own deputies is still stranded outside of Cleveland on that bus. Come along. Therefore, not a man? What a statement. That would not fly in this day and age, let me tell you. But hey, maybe in the 1940s, women were no threat. I do have to say that the story was well thought out. I totally missed the Cleveland bus clue. That was a good one. This 5-Minute Mystery was brought to you by Superior Acting. What's that you say? I received an email this week from Jackie Ramsey. Jackie didn't say where she was from, but did have this question. Hello, Ron. Your podcasts are so good each week, although I don't always agree with you. For example, you said that old-time radio is like a time capsule. Don't get me wrong, I see your point, but you're not actually traveling in time. You're simply hearing a playback from that time. Try as you might, you're not going anywhere. In all time travel theories allowed by real science, there is no way a traveler can go back in time to a time before a time machine is built. Jackie. Well, Jackie, time travel is one of my favorite topics. I wrote many time travel stories in high school that used a time machine of my own invention to travel backwards in time. And I've continued to study this fascinating concept as the years have gone by. You see, we all travel in time. During the last year, I moved forward one year, and so have you. Another way to say that is that we travel in time at the rate of one hour per hour. That is a fact. But the question is, can we travel in time faster or slower than one hour per hour? Or can we actually travel backward in time, going back, say, two hours per hour, or ten or a hundred years per hour? It is mind-boggling to think about time travel. However, I totally disagree with you when you say listening to our past is not time travel. It is our imagination that allows us to do this. When I listen to these time capsules, I'm taken back and I'm standing right there with that reporter or hearing that famous speech. It is real enough for me. Jackie, thank you for your question. I truly loved it. I want to remind all of you that we are quickly approaching the ninth annual month of Spooky. It's coming much faster than I thought. This year is shaping up to be pretty special. It will begin with our 400th episode, and this will be a celebration. It will feature four UFO stories sent in by you guys. Now, I need a lot of scary stories for the month, so if you have something paranormal or whatever, please send it to me. I really need them. So far, I have received four new stories from Michael, Pam, Jeanette, and Buzz. Thank you, guys. And now... This word from Audible. Today's podcast is being brought to you by Audible.com. Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. They have over 180,000 titles to choose from for your iPhone, Android, computer, Kindle. Whatever you have, you can listen to Audible on it. So what am I listening to right now? Spider-Man, The Darkest Hours, written by Tim Butcher and narrated by Jack Melange. 
Did you even know that your favorite Marvel hero was available as an audiobook? Peter Parker's life has hit a peaceful patch. No evildoers have tried to flatten him in weeks, his marriage to Mary Jane is stronger than ever, and he's enjoying his job as a high school science teacher. Life is good. Naturally, that doesn't last. When Peter learns that his old enemy, the Rhino, is on a rampage in Times Square, he suits up as Spider-Man to stop the destructive villain in his tracks. But he's foiled in his attempt to save the city by the Black Cat, who just happens to be a former ally and Old Flame. Now, I had so much fun listening to this book. Jim Butcher is the perfect author for Spider-Man, and this book is short, sweet, and like I said, so very fun. Are you a fan of Spider-Man? You can have his book today. Here's what Audible has set up for us. Audible is offering a free audiobook and 30 days to give you the opportunity to check out their service. To download your free audiobook, go to audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash Ron's Amazing Stories, and you'll be web-slinging today with your friendly neighborhood, Spider-Man. Thank you, Audible. And now, it's time for your stories. These are your stories, sent by you, for you. first story comes from returning writer Jeremy Vaughn from Buffalo, New York. Jeremy last sent in a story called Bigfoot Calling Bigfoot from episode number 362. He writes, Hey Ron, I'm back as promised. I'm still writing my book, which is now nearing completion. I want to thank you for all the help you've been in both sharing my stories and editing them. I've learned a lot from you. This story I'm about to tell you didn't happen to me, but to a friend I made while out collecting chupacabra tales in the state of New Mexico. I hope that you can use it. Jeremy. Well, of course I told him yes, and that I can honestly say of all the cryptids we've had on the show, the chupacabra has been the most elusive. I believe that this is only the second one in the history of the podcast. The chupacabra, or goat sucker, is a legendary creature in the folklore of the Americas, with its first sighting being in Puerto Rico. The name comes from the animal's reported habit of attacking and drinking the blood of livestock, including goats. Here is the story Jeremy collected he calls the Goats of Chupacabra. My wife and I were traveling along the border of Texas and New Mexico. We had just finished visiting Roswell and had decided to stay overnight in Clovis. It was there we met Maria del Carmen. She was a waitress at a small diner just outside of town. We told her that we were traveling the country looking for stories about monsters. She smiled and said that she had one that she would be happy to share. I grabbed my recorder, and here is what she told us. When I was a young girl, I was raised on a farm with many animals. Each night, we would put them all to bed, close the coops, lock the gates, and gather the goats to their pen. One night, I saw a very strange thing. A creature had come in with the goats that night. I wondered at what could be so ugly. It was as big as a goat, hairless, smelled bad, and had a very strange mouth. The bottom teeth seemed to hang out on their own, and the upper teeth pointed straight out like tusks. I'd never seen anything like it, and it scared me. I called my father, and he came running. He yelled, Chupacabra! and fired his gun at it. The thing was lightning fast, and it seemed to almost disappear in an instant. 
After getting the goats settled, we all went in for dinner and then to bed. During the night, I was awoken by men shouting. My father and his brothers were all outside screaming and yelling. Then there was gunfire, followed by the most unbelievable scream. It was a cross between man and monster. I quickly dressed, put my boots on, and ran outside. When I got there, I'll never forget what I saw. Five of our goats lay dead on the ground. Their throats had been torn out. My father and his brothers were dragging the beast from earlier that evening to the fire pit. There, they built a funeral pyre and burned the remains that very night. My father said it was the only way to be sure the monstra would never return. I'll never forget that beast with its strange naked body and awful teeth. But I think it was the eyes that scared me the most. They seemed intelligent and reeked of pure evil. We talked for some time after that. I have no doubt that her story is true and personally one that I would not want to experience. I hope that your listeners enjoyed it and that you can find a place for it on your show. Jeremy Vaughn, Buffalo, New York. Well, Jeremy, as you can see, I did tell your story, and I thank you and Maria for it. I've heard a few Chupacabra stories before, and none of them had any violence. Just the threat of it. I, too, would not like meeting one of these beasties on my own. I think there's a lot of truth to this cryptid because it's the easiest to explain and does have a rich history to back it up. This next story comes from Rita Whitestone in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Ron, I have a ghost story for you. This is my first encounter with them, but it would not be the last. I work as an ER nurse and have more experiences than I can count. This was just the first one. I was a new nurse at our hospital and only been working there for a couple of months. I just brought a patient up to day surgery from the ER for an endoscopy, and they had called back down to ask me to bring her family up. It appears that she only spoke Italian, and they needed someone to help with the consent forms. I found the family, and after dropping them off, I walked past the waiting room to head back down the hall to the elevators. I took the back way to get to the ER, so the hallways were all deserted. It used to be the pediatric wing of the hospital, but it had been shut down for years. Now the rooms are empty and full of stored equipment. As I reached the old nurse's station at the T-junction between the pediatric hallway and the one that goes to the elevators, I saw a little girl standing across from the nurse's station a bit further down the hall. She had big pigtails, was wearing a brown dress, white shoes, and holding a teddy bear. I thought perhaps she was a family member who had walked away from the waiting room. I was concerned that she would go into one of the rooms, get lost, or hurt, so I said, Hey, little girl, what are you doing? You shouldn't be over there. You could get hurt. I walked around the nurse's station to go grab her hand and bring her back. When I came around the other side, she had vanished. Every hair on my body stood up straight, and I turned and ran like a bat out of hell to the elevator. I pounded that button for what seemed like an eternity until the elevator got to the floor. As I got back to the ER, I walked up to the nurse's desk, white as a sheet, and one of the older nurses looked at me and said, What's wrong with you? I remember babbling like an idiot as I tried to tell them what happened. After listening to me for a moment or two, one of the nurses said, Oh, you saw the little girl ghost. She's been around here for years. I remember saying something like, Thanks for telling me. Apparently, the little girl ghost has been seen down in the ER, ducking in and out of patient rooms and peeking around curtains. My husband, who is also a nurse, was working on the fourth floor, and he said that one night a whole row of patients started yelling about a little girl who was running around their rooms. I guess she gets around. Rita Whitestone, Grand Rapids, Michigan. 
Well, Rita, she certainly does. I love a good ghost story, and that is a good one. Thank you for sharing it, and I hope you will share some of those other stories that you spoke of with us. Our last story was sent to us from Killadolics. Sorry, I tried to trace it down, and the best I could do was a user of the same name on Reddit. He or she posted this story there that I'm about to read. So if you are Killadolics and want to tell us your real name and where you're from, I would love to hear from you. Killa writes, We have a really old mental health facility in my neighborhood. They started building it in 1890, and it was fully operational by the early 1900s. It spans across a huge stretch of land. Also, as cliché as it is, there were indigenous settlers on this land as far back as 10,000 years ago. There are four main buildings, West Lawn, East Lawn, North Lawn, and Central Lawn Pavilions. There's also a fifth building that was reserved for children, but it has fallen apart to the point where only one wall remains. The oldest is the West Lawn Pavilion, and the creepiest looking by far. Killa posted a picture of this building, which I will have linked in the show notes. My friend and I have a weird habit of walking around the hospital and through the on-site cemetery. While we were walking past the West Lawn Pavilion, I noticed a doorbell next to the entrance for the very first time. I asked my friend if he dared me to ring it, to which he replied, Uh, no, but I started up the stairs anyway because I am an idiot. Standing at the door, I couldn't help but imagine how long this building has been standing here and how many lives it has affected. I rang the doorbell, and to my surprise, the creepiest buzz sounded off much louder than I anticipated. Exactly at that moment, I got a tickle on the back of my calf, which seriously freaked me out, but I was still in a playful mood, and it wasn't dark out, so I wasn't too scared. Although I did run back down the stairs to my friend. As we started walking towards his car, he said, Oh my God, what happened to your leg? I was wearing shorts and looked at the back of my calf, where I saw a bruise that wasn't there before. It was completely black and purple, and nearly the size of my entire calf. The bruise was there for several weeks, and to this day, I can still feel it. Weird, huh? Needless to say, we don't play there anymore. Kill a Daleks. Well, Killa, that is a strange story. It could be as simple as a broken blood vessel, but I am left in wonder. I don't think I'd want to play around there anymore either. I did track down some information using the picture you posted. I think it might be from the West Lawn Pavilion, Riverview Hospital, Vancouver, Canada. If I'm right, please let me know. At one time, Riverview Hospital was known as Essendale Hospital. Named after Dr. Henry Essen Young, 1862-1939. He played a very important role in establishing the facility. The neighborhood where the hospital is located also became known as the Essendale neighborhood. How about that? Thank you, Killa. Do you have a story that you want to tell on the show? If you do, we want to hear it. It can be about any subject and from any genre. Heck, it doesn't even have to be true. Original fiction or stories from the public domain are quite welcome. To submit them, just head to ronsamazingstories.com and click on the Story Submissions banner. Fill out the form and soon your story will be heard. Do you have a story but don't want to write it? That's okay, too. Just leave your contact information, a brief description of your story, and I'll get back to you. We can write it together. However, if you don't do it, your story remains just that. Your story. Why not make it our story?
Our featured story this week comes from the pen of science fiction author Ben Bova. Ben is an American writer and is the author of more than 120 works of science fact and fiction. He is a six-time winner of the Hugo Award, a former editor of Analog Magazine, and the president of the Science Fiction Writers of America. Ben is 86 years old and currently lives in Florida. Quite the resume. This week we feature his story, The Next Logical Step. It was written in 1962 during the heart of the Cold War. It appeared in the May edition of Analog Science Fact and Fiction. Ordinarily, the military would not want to have others know the final details of their war plans. But logically, there might be a time where it could save the world. Here is the next logical step read for us by the Collie. I don't really see where this problem has anything to do with me, the CIA man said. And frankly, there are a lot of more important things I could be doing. Ford, the physicist, glanced at General Leroy. The general had that quizzical expression on his face, the look that meant he was about to do something decisive. Would you like to see the problem firsthand? The general asked innocently. The CIA man took a quick look at his wristwatch. Okay, if it doesn't take too long. It's late enough already. It won't take very long, will it, Ford? The general said, getting out of his chair. Not very long, Ford agreed. Only a lifetime. The CIA man grunted as they went to the doorway and left the general's office. Going down the dark, deserted hallway, their footsteps echoed hollowly. I can't overemphasize the seriousness of the problem, General Leroy said to the CIA man. Eight ranking members of the general staff have either resigned their commissions or gone straight to the violent ward after just one session with the computer. The CIA man scowled. Is this area secure? General Leroy's face turned red. This entire building is as secure as any edifice in the free world, mister. And it's empty. We're the only living people inside here at this hour. I'm not taking any chances. Just want to be sure. Perhaps if I explain the computer a little more, Ford said, changing the subject, you'll know what to expect. Good idea, said the man from CIA. We told you that this is the most modern, most complex, and delicate computer in the world. Nothing like it has ever been attempted before. Anywhere. I know that they don't have anything like it, the CIA man agreed. And you also know, I suppose, that it was built to simulate actual war situations. We fight wars in this computer. Wars with missiles and bombs and gas. Real wars, complete down to the tiniest detail. The computer tells us what will actually happen to every missile, every city, every man. Who dies, how many planes are lost, how many trucks will fail to start on a cold morning, whether a battle is won or lost. General Leroy interrupted. The computer runs these analyses for both sides, so that we can see what's happening to them, too. CIA man gestured impatiently. War game simulations aren't new. You've been doing them for years. Yes, but this machine is different, Ford pointed out. It not only gives a much more detailed war game, it's the next logical step in the development of machine-simulated war games. He hesitated dramatically. Well, what is it? We've added a variation of the electroencephalograph. The CIA man stopped walking. The electro-what? Electroencephalograph. You know, a recording device that reads the electrical patterns of your brain, like the electrocardiograph. Oh. But you see, we've given the EEG a reverse twist. Instead of using a machine that makes a recording of the brain's electrical wave output, we've developed a device that will take the computer's readout tapes and turn them into electrical patterns that are put into your brain. I don't get it. General Leroy took over. You sit at the machine's control console. A helmet is placed over your head. You set the machine in operation. You see the results. Yes, Ford went on. Instead of reading rows of figures from the computer's printer, you actually see the war being fought. Complete visual and auditory hallucinations. You can watch the progress of the battles. And as you change strategy and tactics, you can see the results before your eyes. The idea originally was to make it easier for the general staff to visualize strategic situations, General Leroy said. But everyone who's used the machine has either resigned his commission or gone insane, Ford added. The CIA man cocked an eye at Leroy. You've used the computer? Correct. And you have neither resigned nor cracked up. General Leroy nodded. I called you in. Before the CIA man could comment, Ford said, The computer's right inside this doorway. Let's get this over with while the building is still empty. 
They stepped in. The physicist and the general showed the CIA man through the room-filling rows of massive consoles. It's all transistorized and subminiaturized, of course, Ford exclaimed. That's the only way we could build so much detail in the machine and still have it small enough to fit inside a single building. A single building? Oh, yes. This is only the control section. Most of this building is taken up by the circuits, the memory banks, and the rest of it. Hmm. They showed him, finally, to a small desk, studded with control buttons and dials. The single spotlight above the desk lit it brilliantly, in harsh contrast to the semi-darkness of the rest of the room. Since you've never run the computer before, Ford said, General Leroy will do the controlling. You just sit and watch what happens. The general sat in one of the well-padded chairs and donned a grotesque headgear that was connected to the desk by half a dozen wires. The CIA man took his chair slowly. When they put one of the bulky helmets on him, he looked up at them, squinting a little at the bright light. This, this isn't going to, well, do me any damage, is it? My goodness, no, Ford said. You mean mentally? No, of course not. You're not on the general staff, so it shouldn't, it won't, affect you the way it did the others. Their reaction had nothing to do with the computer per se. Several civilians have used the computer with no ill effects, General Leroy said. Ford has used it many times. The CIA man nodded, and they closed the transparent visor over his face. He sat there and watched General Leroy press a series of buttons and then turn a dial. Can you hear me? The general's voice came muffled through the helmet. Yes, he said. All right, here we go. You're familiar with situation 121. That's what we're going to be seeing. Situation 121 was a standard war game. The CIA man was well acquainted with it. He watched the general flip a switch, then sit back and fold his arms over his chest. A row of lights on the desk console began blinking on and off. One, two, three. Down to the end of the row, then back to the beginning again. On and off, on and off. And then, somehow, he could see it. He was poised, incredibly, somewhere in space, and he could see it all in a funny, blurry, double-sided dreamlike way. He seemed to be seeing several pictures and hearing many voices all at once. It was all mixed up, and yet it made a weird kind of sense. For a panicked instant, he wanted to rip the helmet off his head. It's only an illusion, he told himself, forcing calm on his unwilling nerves. Only an illusion. But it seemed strangely real. He was watching the Gulf of Mexico. He could see Florida off to his right and the arching coast of the southern United States. He could even make out the Rio Grande River. Situation 1 to 1 started, he remembered, with the discovery of missile-bearing enemy submarines in the Gulf. Even as he watched the whole area, as though perched on a satellite, he could see underwater and close up the menacing shadowy figure of a submarine gliding through the crystal blue sea. He saw, too, a patrol plane as it spotted the submarine and sent an urgent radio warning. The underwater picture dissolved in a bewildering burst of bubbles. A missile had been launched. Within seconds, another burst, this time a nuclear depth charge, utterly destroyed the submarine. It was confusing. He was every place at once. The details were overpowering, but the total picture was agonizingly clear. Six submarines fired missiles from the Gulf of Mexico. Four were immediately sunk, but too late. New Orleans, St. Louis, and three Air Force bases were obliterated by hydrogen-fused warheads. The CIA man was familiar with the opening stages of the war. The first missile fired at the United States was the signal for whole fleets of missiles and bombers to launch themselves at the enemy. It was confusing to see the world at once. At times he could not tell if the fireball and mushroom cloud was over Chicago or Shanghai, New York or Novosibirsk, Baltimore or Budapest. It did not make much difference, really. They all got it in the first few hours of the war, as did London and Moscow, Washington and Peking, Detroit and Delhi, and many, many more. The defensive systems on all sides seemed to operate well, except that there were never enough anti-missiles. Defense systems were expensive compared to attack rockets. It was cheaper to build a deterrent than to defend against it. The missiles flashed up from submarines and railway cars, from underground silos and stratospheric jets. Secret ones fired off automatically when a certain airbase command boat ceased beaming out a restraining radio signal. The defensive systems were simply overloaded. And when the bombs ran out, the missiles carried dust and germs and gas on and on. For six days and six firelit nights, launch, boost, coast, re-enter, death. And now it was over. The CIA man thought. The missiles were all gone. The airplanes were exhausted. 
The nations that had built the weapons no longer existed. By the rules he knew of, the war should have ended. Yet the fighting did not end. The machine knew better. There were still many ways to kill an enemy, time-tested ways. There were armies fighting in four continents, armies that had marched overland or splashed ashore from the sea or dropped out of the skies. Incredibly, the war went on. When the tanks ran out of gas and the flamethrowers became useless and even prosaic artillery pieces had no more rounds to fire, there were still ample guns and even simpler bayonets and swords. The proud armies, the descendants of the Alexanders, the Caesars, the Timujans, the Wellingtons, the Grants, the Rommels, relived their evolution in reverse. The war went on. Slowly, inevitably, the armies split apart into smaller and smaller units until the tortured countryside that so recently had felt the impact of nuclear war once again knew the tread of bands of armed marauders, the tiny savage groups stranded in alien lands far from the homes and families that they knew to be destroyed, carried on a mockery of a war, lived off the land, fought their own countrymen if the occasion suited, and revived the ancient terror of hand-wielded personal one head at a time killing. The CIA man watched the world disintegrate. Death was an individual business now, and none the better for no longer being mass-produced. In agonized fascination, he saw the myriad ways in which a man might die. Murder was only one of them. Radiation, disease, toxic gases that lingered and drifted on the once innocent winds, and finally, the most efficient destroyer of them all, starvation. Three billion people, give or take a meaningless hundred million, lived on the planet Earth when the war began. Now, with the tenuous thread of civilization burned away, most of those who were not killed by the fighting itself succumb inexorably to starvation. Not everyone died, of course. Life went on. Some were lucky. A long darkness settled on the world. Life went on for a few, a pitiful few, a bitter, hateful, suspicious, savage few. Cities became pest holes. Books became fuel. Knowledge died. Civilization was completely gone from the planet Earth. The helmet was lifted slowly off his head. The CIA man found that he was too weak to raise his arms and help. He was shivering and damp with perspiration. Now you see, Ford said quietly, why the military men cracked up when they used the computer. General Leroy even was pale. How can a man with any conscience at all direct a military operation when he knows that that will be the consequence. The CIA man struck up a cigarette and pulled hard on it. He exhaled sharply. <sighs> Are all the war games like that? Every plan? Some are worse, Ford said. We picked an average one for you. Even some of the brush fire games get out of hand and end up like that. So... What do you intend to do? Why did you call me in? What can I do? You're with the CIA, the general said. Don't you handle espionage? Yes, but what's that got to do with it? The general looked at him. It seems to me that the next logical step is to make damn certain that they get the plans to this computer. And fast! End of The Next Logical Step by Ben Bova Pretty amazing story, but it, when it comes right down to it, it is dated. Or is it? Is our current world all that different from 1962? I think we can all agree that a computer no longer needs to take up an entire building. So to make this story happen today, all you'd have to leak to the other side is the basic code and hope they figure out that nuclear war is pretty bad. Are you ready for another story? This one is being brought to us by Laddie's Goodies. Good treats for your dog to eat. They use all natural products with no sugar, preservatives, salts, or harmful ingredients. So check out their online store at gladdiesgoodies.com. That is gladdiesgoodies.com. And don't forget to use our very own promo code, RONS, to get a 20% discount on all of your purchases. That is 
R-O-N-S. Thank you, Gladdy. As read by Amazing Stories, read by Amazing People. This time on As Read By, we have a short story that was suggested to us by Rosen Hauser in Bridgeport, Texas. Rosen sent in this email. Hello, Ron. I love the podcast, and I love the stories. A perfect match in anyone's book. I know that you're a fan of the pulp mags of the 1950s and 60s. I collect those as a hobby, and it might interest you to know that some of these books can sell anywhere from $16 an issue up to $100, depending upon condition. One of my favorites to collect is If Magazine, edited by the great Frederick Poole, one of the greatest science fiction authors of our time. One of my favorite short stories from that era is called An Incident on Route 12. As a kid, I remember reading this story and I was scared to ride in my dad's 1956 Packard sedan for several months. That's going to make a lot more sense after you read the enclosed story. I hope you can make use of it and thank you for your amazing stories. Rosen Well, Rosen, I read the story and immediately knew that it had to be on the podcast. But was it in the public domain? I quickly went to Project Gutenberg to see if, by chance, they had certified it. I found it waiting for me. The story was first published in the Worlds of If magazine in their January of 1962 edition, and after extensive research, they did not uncover any evidence that the U.S. copyright on the story was renewed. So, we get to hear Rosen's tale and find out why he regarded his father's 1956 Packard as a danger zone. Here is an incident on Route 12 as read for us by Cody Appadale. I leave you with the tagline. He was already a thief, prepared to steal again, but what he didn't know was that he himself was the booty. An Incident on Route 12 by James W. Schmitz Published in If Worlds of Science Fiction January 1962 Phil Garfield was 30 miles south of the little town of Redmond on Route 12 when he was startled by a series of sharp clinking noises. They came from under the Packard's hood. The car immediately began to lose speed. Garfield jammed down the accelerator and had a sense of sick helplessness at the lack of response from the motor. The Packard rolled on, getting rid of its momentum, and came to a stop. Phil Garfield swore shakily. He checked his watch, switched off the headlights, and climbed out into the dark road. A delay of even half an hour here might be disastrous. It was past midnight, and he had another 110 miles to cover to reach the small private airfield where Mage waited for him and the $30,000 in the suitcase on the Packard's front seat. He thought of the bank guard. A man had made a clumsy play at being a hero, and had set off the fool woman who'd run screaming into their line of fire. One dead, perhaps two. Garfield hadn't stopped to look at the evening paper. But he knew they were hunting for him. He glanced up and down the road. No other headlights in sight at the moment. No light from a building showing on the forested hills. He reached back into the car and brought out the suitcase, his gun, a big flashlight, and the box of shells which had been standing beside the suitcase. He broke the box open, shoved a handful of shells and the thirty-eight into his coat pocket, then took the suitcase and flashlight over to the shoulder of the road and set them down. There was no point in groping out under the Packard's hood. When it came to mechanics, Phil Garfield was a moron, and well aware of it. The car was useless to him now, except his bait. Should he leave it standing where it was? No, Garfield decided. To anyone driving past, it would merely suggest a necking party or a drunk sleeping off his load before continuing home. He might have to wait an hour or more before someone decided to stop. He didn't have the time. He reached in through the window, hauled the top of the steering wheel towards him, and put his weight against the rear window frame. The Packard began to move slowly backwards at a slant across the road. In a minute or two, he had it in position. Not blocking the road entirely, which would arouse immediate suspicion, but angled across it, lights out, empty, 
both front doors open and inviting a passerby's investigation. Garfield carried the suitcase and flashlight across the right-hand shoulder of the road, moved up among the trees and undergrowth of the slope above the shoulder. Placing the suitcase beneath the bushes, he brought out the 38, clicked the safety off, and stood waiting. Some 10 minutes later, a set of headlights appeared speeding up Route 12 from the direction of Redmond. Phil Garfield went down on one knee before he came within range of the lights. Now he was completely concealed by the vegetation. The car slowed as it approached, breaking nearly to a stop 60 feet from the stalled Packard. There were several people inside it. Garfield heard voices, then a woman's loud laugh. The driver tapped his horn inquiringly twice, moved the car slowly forward. As the headlights went past him, Garfield got to his feet among the bushes, took a step down towards the road, raising his gun. Then he caught the distant gleam of a second set of headlights approaching from Redmond. He swore under his breath and dropped back out of sight. The car below him reached the Packard, edged costly around it, then rolled on with a sudden roar of acceleration. The second car stopped when still a hundred yards away, the Packard caught in the motionless glare of its lights. Garfield heard the steady purring of a powerful motor. For almost a minute, nothing else happened. Then the car came gliding smoothly on, stopped again no more than thirty feet to Garfield's left. He could see it now through the screening bushes. A big job, a long, low four-door sedan. The motor continued to purr. After a moment, a door on the far side of the car opened and slammed shut. A man walked quickly out into the beam of the headlights and started towards the Packard. Phil Garfield rose from his crouching position, the 38 in his right hand, flashlight in his left. If the driver was alone, the thing was now cinched. But if there was somebody else in the car, somebody capable of fast decisive action, a slip in the next 10 seconds might cost him the sedan, and quite probably his freedom and life. Garfield lined up the 38 center of the approaching man's head. He let his breath out slowly as the fellow came level with him in the road and squeezed off one shot. Instantly, he went bounding down the slope to the road. The bullet had flung the man sideways to the pavement. Garfield darted past him to the left, crossed the beam of the headlights, and was in darkness again on the far side of the road, snapping on his flashlight as he sprinted up to the car. The flashlight showed the seats empty. Garfield dropped the light, jerked both doors open in turn, gun pointing into the car's interior. Then he stood still for a moment, weak and almost dizzy with relief. There was no one inside. The sedan was his. The man he had shot through the head lay face down on the road, his hat flung a dozen feet away from him. Route 12 still stretched out in dark silence to east and west. There should be time enough to clean up the job before anyone else came along. Garfield brought the suitcase down and put it in the front seat of the sedan, then started back to get his victim off the road and out of sight. He scaled the man's hat into the bushes, bent down, grasped the ankles, and started to haul him towards the left side of the road, where the ground dropped off sharply beyond the shoulder. The body made a high, squealing sound and began to writhe violently. Shocked, Garfield dropped the legs and hurriedly took the gun from his pocket, moving back a step. The squealing noise rose in intensity as the wounded man quickly flopped over twice like a struggling fish. Arms and legs sawing about with startling energy. Garfield clicked off the safety, pumped three shots into his victim's back. The squeals ended abruptly. The body continued to jerk for another second or two, then lay still. Garfield shoved the gun back into his pocket. The unexpected interruption had unnerved him. His hands shook as he reached down again for the stranger's ankles. Then he jerked his hands back and straightened up, staring. From the side of the man's chest, a few inches below the right arm, something like a thick black stick, three feet long, protruded now through the material of the coat. It shone, gleaming wetly in the light from the car. Even in that first, uncomprehending instant, something in its appearance brought a surge of sick disgust to Garfield's throat. Then the stick bent slowly halfway down its length, forming a sharp angle, and its tip opened into what could have been three blunt black claws, which scrambled clumsily against the pavement. Very faintly, the squealing began again, and the body's back arched up as if another stick-like arm were pushing desperately against the ground beneath it. Garfield acted in a blur of horror. He emptied the thirty-eight into the thing at his feet almost without realizing he was doing it. Then, dropping the gun, he seized one of the ankles, ran backwards to the shoulder of the road, dragging the body behind him. In the darkness at the edge of the shoulder, he let go of it, stepped around to the other side, and with two frantically savage kicks sent the body plunging over the shoulder and down the steep slope beyond. He heard it crash through the bushes for some seconds, then stop. 
He turned and ran back to the sedan, scooping up his gun as he went past. He scrambled into the driver's seat and slammed the door shut behind him. His hands shook violently on the steering wheel as he pressed down on the accelerator. The motor roared to life and the big car surged forward. He edged it past the Packard, curse a loud and horrified shock, jammed on the accelerator and went flashing up Route 12, darkness racing beside and behind him. What had it been? Something that wore what seemed to be a man's body like a suit of clothes, moved the body as a man moves, driving a man's car, roached armed, roached legged itself. Garfield drew a long shuddered breath. Then, as he slowed for a curve, there was a spark of reddish light in the rear view mirror. He stared at the spark for an instant, braked the car to a stop, rolled down the window, and looked back. Far behind him, along Route 12, a fire burned, approximately at the point where the Packard had stalled out, where something had gone rolling off the road into the bushes. Something, Garfield added mentally, that found fiery automatic destruction when death came to it, so that its secrets would remain unrevealed. But for him, the fire meant the end of a nightmare. He rolled the window up, took out a cigarette, lit it, and pressed the accelerator. In incredulous fright, he felt the nose of the car lift upwards, headlights sweeping up from the road into the trees. Then the headlights winked out. Beyond the windshield, dark tree branches floated down towards him, the night sky beyond. He reached frantically for the door handle. A steel wrench clamped silently around each of his arms, drawing them in against his sides, immobilizing them there. Garfield gasped looked up in the mirror and saw a pair of faintly gleaming red eyes, watching him from the rear of the car. Two of the things. The second one stood behind him, out of sight, holding him. They'd been in what seemed to be the trunk compartment, and they had come out. The eyes in the mirror vanished. A moist black roach arm reached over the back of the seat beside Garfield, picked up the cigarette he had dropped, extinguished it with rather horribly human motions, then took up Garfield's gun and drew it back out of sight. He expected a shot, but none came. One doesn't fire a bullet through the suit one intends to wear. It wasn't until that thought occurred to him that tough Phil Garfield began to scream. He was still screaming minutes later when behind the windshield, the spaceship floated into view among the stars. What a great story. And Rosen, I could see why you wanted to stay away from your dad's car for a while. Very creepy, and so very well written. The author, James H. Schmidt, was a science fiction author born in Hamburg, Germany, to American parents. Schmitz was educated at Real Gymnasium in Hamburg, and grew up speaking both English and German. The family spent World War I in the United States and then returned to Germany. Schmitz traveled to Chicago in 1930 to go to business school, then switched to a correspondence course in journalism. Unable to find a job because of the Great Depression, he returned to Germany to work with his father's company. Schmitz lived in various German cities, where he worked for the International Harvester Company until his family left shortly before World War II broke out in Europe. During the war, he served as an aerial photographer in the Pacific for the United States Air Corps. After the war, he and his brother-in-law managed a business which manufactured trailers until 1949. It was then he began a fruitful writing career that continued into the early 2000s, even though he passed away in 1981. Our story was read for us today by Cody Appadale, a listener and friend to the podcast. This is the second time that Cody has read a story for us. He read the pulp mag classic Longevity back in episode number 382. To Cody I say... You did a great job, man, and thank you for taking part in the program. If you have a story to submit like Rosen, or if you want to read one like Cody did, please let me know and we'll see what we can do. The more work we do together on the show, the better we become. How about that? podcast full of stories. I want to thank Jackie Ramsey, Jeremy Vaughn, Rita Whitestone, Killa Daleks, 
Rosenhauser, and Cody Appadale for helping us out today. You were all amazing. If you want to follow the podcast or the blog, just head to ronsamazingstories.com. There you will find an amazing number of links that will fit every need. Do you want to help the show? The best thing you can do is to tell your friends all about it, and please leave reviews or feedback wherever you listen. This helps us to grow. Thank you for listening, and I hope you come again to find out what are Ron's Amazing Stories. All of the vintage audio used in the podcast is believed to be in the public domain. Ron's Amazing Stories does not own the rights to any of the old-time radio used here. If you hold the rights to any of the shows played, please contact us immediately at ronsamazingstories.com.